Hello and welcome back to Exothermic Plays Games. I'm Exothermic and the date today is Sunday, October 20th, 2024. I've been doing a countdown of my favorite video games of all time through each day of the year, and coming in at number 73 is Cthulhu Saves the World. If you look all the way back into February, you'll see that I ranked Cthulhu Saves Christmas as my 312th favorite game. This one came first, but Christmas is the prequel, and now you get to see the main game. Notably, this game is frequently on sale for less than a dollar. Literally everyone should play this game, and there is next to nothing stopping you. So, what's going on here? Cthulhu is ready to destroy the world, but at the last second, he is cursed, and all of his power is drained away. The narrator informs him, because this game is constantly breaking the fourth wall and it's great, that the only way to remove the curse is to become a true hero. Eager to get down with the murdering and stuff, Cthulhu agrees to begin his path down the hero's journey. As if by fate, he immediately finds a damsel in distress whom he saves. This is, as explained by the narrator, not what they meant. Uh, but now he's stuck with her, because she's head over heels in love with him. The game is entirely satire of old turn-based JRPGs, and also of Lovecraftian literature. The story is nonsense, filled with MacGuffins and deus ex machina, but the dialogue is so witty and really just hilarious that none of that matters. I have never laughed so much playing a JRPG as I have with Cthulhu Saves the World, and replaying much of the game to record this video, the jokes still hold up. I already mentioned Umi's fatuation with our hero, but there's loads to talk about here. There's a group of what would be traditional fantasy heroes that are constantly trying to kill you because, you know, you're a horrible monster that wants to destroy the world, and you just keep batting them away. Uh, one of your earlier companions to join you is a sentient sword that just kind of waddles around. Uh, there's the, for the lack of a better word, humanitarian concerns from Cthulhu regarding zombies. Uh, my favorite party member you eventually get is a cat from space who, based on dialogue in the game, is Cthulhu's former college roommate. Every twist, every turn, there's something funny <laughs> happening, whether it be in your face's dialogue, uh, references to other games, or just some visual joke with the sprites, which for a dollar is already well worth the price of admission. But on top of that, the game's actually good. Don't get me wrong, it's not some crazy in-depth combat system with endless character customization or anything, but it's engaging, fun, and actually has quality of life systems that large budget, serious big boy RPGs could stand to learn from. Combat is a turn-based system, and each character has their basic attack, but also has sets of spells and techniques that cost MP to utilize. The more you hit enemies, you build up a hit combo, which you can spend when you use a finisher move for massive damage, assuming you've built the combo high enough. This is already serviceable and fun and engaging and all of that, but each character also has a unique set of Unite moves. Every possible combination of two characters makes a different attack with this, and each character can only participate in one Unite ability per fight. So with a four-person party, you can do up to two total. The flexibility of these moves and the way that using one eliminates all other options with those characters for that fight is actually a really compelling system and one that I wish they leaned more on throughout the game. 
That being said, there were several that became especially helpful over the course of longer boss fights, and it was great to have these powerful thematic abilities, even though they did cost a lot of MP to do it, so you would probably just save it for those fights. Leveling itself is interesting, because each time a character levels up, you can pick between two possible abilities they can learn. These can be passive or activated with costs, but the idea that you're picking between two things each time means you can carve out unique roles for characters, especially as your party and playable character options grow. The other thing that's really great about the combat is that each time you finish a fight, your characters all automatically heal to full. So uh, you can kind of, um, it's designed and balanced around just sliding into home, essentially. Even a lot of the random encounters, you might just barely live, at least while you're still lower level in that area. But what doesn't heal to full every time is your MP, so you still kind of have to like ration this out and think about some longevity things, which again is pretty interesting when you're doing everything else. I don't want to oversell it though. Uh, each character does fit a role of some kind, you're not customizing them a ton, and they're mostly stuck in that role. But the changes are more about if you want them to sacrifice a little bit of that for some flexibility or just go all in. The big quality of life thing the game does, and I love this, is something I realized recently had changed how I approached JRPGs going forward. Over the course of the year, I've already covered the first six Final Fantasy games. I played and recorded all six of those as the Pixel Remaster versions, and largely did everything on my Steam Deck. With the Pixel Remasters, there's a button you can press to toggle random enemy encounters while running around, which was critical in trying to cut down on the amount of time I spent recording these games as I keep up with my daily release schedule. So what I would do is I would turn off encounters and then blitz through each area of the game until I hit a boss or some non-random encounter. And if that boss or other thing crushed me, that meant it was, in fact, time to grind a little. So I'd turn off my recording, park myself at the nearest save point if I'm in a dungeon or, you know, just outside of town if I'm outside of town, and just kill stuff while healing from tents or the inn if I'm at a town right outside the boss, until I felt comfortable continuing again where I'd turned the recording back on. This saved a ton of time, and actually helped a lot in keeping the difficulty curve more exciting without just over-leveling everything, or under-leveling everything. It kind of allowed me to, to kind of be where I needed to be. This made the games more fun. This is a strategy I picked up from my time with Cthulhu Saves the World. In this game, there's random encounters, and while you can't turn them off, there's a set number of them per dungeon. Let's say it's 25 encounters, so you do the 25, and then there are no more random encounters in that whole dungeon. So I would again park near a save point, grind out the encounters, and keep restoring my MP with the save point, and then go clear the dungeon itself. The great thing about how Cthulhu approaches this, however, is that it was designed from the ground up for it, meaning it is the intended difficulty curve. Your characters should be the correct level to have the experience that you were supposed to have with every boss fight. If you want a little more challenge, grind less. If you want it easier, you can manually trigger additional fights after you've burned through the random quota if you want to keep leveling. It's a very convenient system that's not only player driven, but fun focused. And again, I can't overstate how great it is that I don't have to worry about whether or not I'm over or under leveled because I know exactly where the game wants me to be. So let me know. Am I crazy for ranking this game higher than all six, plus a few others, of the first Final Fantasy games, which it directly parodies? Has Cthulhu's horrific visage clouded my thoughts and driven me entirely mad? Or, as I suspect, is this game just absolutely hilarious with engaging yet simple combat that doesn't outwear its welcome, 
excellent character and world design, and player-friendly features that don't distract from the fun, which actually does earn this game a spot this high on my rankings. Join me tomorrow as I talk about my 72nd favorite game, where I probably shouldn't eat or drink anything I can find in this wasteland, but at least it'll help me shoot in slow motion.